the Lord called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel rose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But Eli answered, I did not call my son, lie down again. Verse 7, Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor had the word of the Lord yet been revealed to him. Verse 8, So the Lord called Samuel again for the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli discerned that the Lord was calling the boy. And Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be if he calls you, that you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Then the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. The Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. In that day I will carry out against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knew, because his sons brought a curse on themselves and he did not rebuke them. Therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. So Samuel lay down until morning, then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. But Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. And then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, and he said, Here I am. He said, What is the word that he spoke to you? Please do not hide it from me. May God do so to you, and more also, if you hide anything from me of all the words that he spoke to you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. Thus Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fail. All Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was confirmed as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, because the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Could you go and turn the air up? I know it's freezing out there right when it starts blowing. Uh, yeah, just turn it up one. You don't have to turn it on. First Samuel chapter 3. I tell you, in this time that we're in, in Hurricane Ian, how many notice there's a lot of help that has come from a lot of places, isn't there? Aren't you thankful for that? Uh, they've had stories on the news about people who have come from all corners of the United States that have the, the time or the resources to come down and to be here. I've met in the course of uh, uh, my limited travels either. I met some from Mississippi and some from Louisiana that were down here to help with things and some from Illinois that were here to help with things. The, tragically, the news had it on the other night that a man came down from Michigan to help with things and unfortunately got in some water and uh, some uh, bacteria got in a cut and unfortunately the man tragically passed away and he came down here to to help with things, but people are coming because they look and uh, you wonder what kind of news reports that they're getting up north, right? Uh, and they see things and, and uh, the devastation that's here and many want to come and they want to help and they want to be used to help. And I'm thankful for that. How many as people of God want to be used by God, right? To be involved in the things that God would be doing in the words of the Lord Jesus, to be about our Father's business, right? To be about sharing His Word and praying for the lost and sharing the gospel with the lost and to do good unto our neighbor as unto ourselves in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. To do good to all as we have opportunity, especially to those of the household of faith, but yes, to all as God will provide. How do we want to be used by God, right? And, and to... Be used by Him, not for our glory, but again, as was sung tonight, for His glory. As Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, for good works to be done, not so that we may be glorified, but so that folks would see and glorify our Father who is in heaven. And to give thanks and praise unto the Lord. Well, tonight, in 1 Samuel chapter 3, a very familiar passage to many, this is the call of young Samuel, the call of the Lord upon Samuel. And Samuel, I love people in Scripture like Daniel. We were at Daniel in the lion's den a few weeks ago, and sometimes when folks read the book of Daniel, they don't realize there was a lot of years that passed there. And Daniel's service to the Lord is recorded from the time he was a young man to the time he's 
Some scholars think at least 80, maybe even as old as 100 years old. How many know that's just such a blessing for someone to serve the Lord from a young age to an old age? And here it is, this Samuel. He was dedicated to the Lord at a very young age. In fact, from before birth, truth be told, if you, I would encourage you to read 1 Samuel chapter 1 and 1 Samuel chapter 2 sometime between the next couple days or so. And you'll find that Samuel's birth was miraculous. His mom, Hannah, and his dad, Elkanah, Hannah was barren. She couldn't bear a child. They had tried to conceive, but she was not able to conceive a child. And it distressed her greatly. She called out to God for a child. How many have ever noticed in the scripture that there is a theme that runs where a woman is barren and not with child? And then God miraculously would open up the womb, say, of Sarah or of Rachel, or in this case, Hannah. How many notice that's a theme in Scripture? And I will tell you, what that's pointing to is that a womb is barren, but who can fill that womb? But God can cause a miracle to take place for that womb to be filled. And I will tell you, ultimately, that's pointing to Christ. And you may say, well, how? Who could be more barren than a virgin womb? And yet, what did God do? But he sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. How many are thankful that, that even that, that points to Christ? And when, when it is that Hannah, she couldn't conceive a child, so she goes and she's in the house of the Lord and she meets Eli. Eli is the priest of the time. Eli is mentioned in this passage here in 1 Samuel chapter 3. And she is so distressed that Eli actually thinks in 1 Samuel 1 and 2, thinks that she is... She is somehow under, uh, uh, under the influence. And he corrects her. And it's not that at all. She was just so distressed and crying out to God with such sincerity that she looked so distressed. And indeed she was because she was childless. And what happened is Eli prophesied that she would bear a child. And she did bear a child. And she promised God that if she bore a child, that she would dedicate that child to the service being used by God. From birth on. And so she made that promise. And that vow to God. And indeed a child was born. And if you read in 1 Samuel chapter 2. And you read where it is. That Hannah gives praise to God. For blessing her with his child Samuel. When you, if you read that. And compare that to Luke chapter 2. What we call the Magnificat of Mary. Where she praises God. Because she's being used to. Bring the Messiah to the world. You compare those verses, there's very similar themes there. Again, pointing to Christ. Here it is, is that, that Samuel is born and what happens? But she dedicates him to the service of the Lord right from the start. And he is there at the, at the house of God and serving under Eli, attending the needs from a young boy even, all the way up and he will live to be an old man. And he serves the Lord all of his days. Well, here we are in 1 Samuel chapter 3, and Josephus, the Jewish historian, will tell us he thinks that Samuel was 12 years old at this time. Now, other commentaries will say he might have been a little bit older, but I will tell you, if he was 12, that's even, how many know we read in Scripture of Christ as a child, and then we read of Christ mainly next, a little bit when he was 2, when the wise men come, but then he's 12, and he's at the temple. And notice Luke 2.52 says that Christ grew in stature and in favor with God and with men. The very same words almost exactly are mentioned of Samuel. That he grew in stature with God and with men. And then he has this miraculous encounter at approximately age 12. Although again it might have been older than that. But that's what Josephus thought he would be about 12 when this occurred. And here it is, is that what happens, he's there and he's sleeping at night and he hears a voice call out his name, Samuel, Samuel. And he does not yet know the Lord and he doesn't know the voice of the Lord or the word of the Lord yet. He's been serving and tending to needs that are there. He's been serving under Eli and doing what he's asked to do, but he doesn't yet personally know the Lord at the beginning of this passage, but he will before the passage is over. How many are thankful for that? And so here it is, is that he's there, and he's hearing the voice of God, but he doesn't think it's the voice of God, he thinks it's Eli's voice, the priest calling him to come and do this, or to do that, to serve in some capacity, and in some way. But it's the voice of God, it's not the voice of Eli, it's the voice of God. First thing tonight, what we're going to talk about is how to be used by God, 
Well, the first thing is this. Before I talk about any trait or characteristic that we might have, how many know to be used by God depends first and foremost upon the God who speaks and the God who calls? How many know we don't, that there is none who is righteous. No, not one. There is none who seeks after God. There is none in and of their own strength and left to their own devices who would serve God in any kind of capacity that would actually be meaningful and accepted before God. How many know your salvation, your service of God starts with the God who speaks? God is the one from whom these things come. It goes off. God is always the one to take the initiative, is he not? He's the one who always takes the first step. Go to the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve, they sinned. But what did they do? Did they sin and then say, oh, they, did they go to God and say, oh, please forgive us, we sinned? Is that how it happened? No. How did it happen? They went and hid themselves, covered themselves with fig leaves, thinking somehow they could hide themselves from God. Who came searching for who? They didn't come searching for God. God came looking for them. How many know it depends first and foremost upon God who would speak? You go to Abraham. Genesis chapter 12. Did Abraham go around? Abram as he was known before his name was changed of course. But Abraham. Did he go around saying. Oh God speak to me. Oh God. No. Says that God came in Genesis chapter 12. And God came to Abraham. You come in the psalm and in the New Testament book of Romans, and I quote it already. There is none who seeks God, none who understands, none righteous, none who would do good. No, not one. I've often said, I think, much like that Psalm 115 says, not to us, not to us, repeats it twice, right? Because we're so prone to take glory in ourselves and to walk in pride. I think, too, when it is that the Old Testament, and then Paul quotes it in the New Testament, there is none righteous, and then what's it followed up with? No, not one. Because you know what everybody thinks, right? There is none righteous. We hear something like that. We think, well, there might be an exception. <laughs> and we tend to think the exception is us. Everybody who thinks they're exception, they think they're exceptional, right? But how many know that it follows it up? Just in case anybody had that thought, there is none righteous. No, not one. Sometimes in the classroom, I'll say, no one should be talking right now. And yes, that means you. And I'll say that, right? I won't say anybody's name. I'll say, yes, that means you. Then, but Mr. Strzok, I didn't call your name. I just said, that means you. Because it applies to everybody, right? There is none righteous, no, not one. And so here it is, is that it is God who initiates. Man never initiates. God initiates you talk John chapter 15, verse 16, speaking to his disciples, Jesus said this, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and appointed you that you should bear fruit, appointed, ordained that you should bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain. How many know uh, that it is, if you're saved, you would never left to your own devices, think to cry out to God. The old song had it right. You did not wait for me to cry out to you, but you let me hear your voice calling me. Now indeed, the offer of salvation must be received, but I would tell you, no one's going to be saved. I, I thought of this salvation thing on my own. How many are thankful that knowing God, serving God, it begins with God himself. If he did not reveal himself, we would know nothing about him. Who could go up, so to speak, to bring Christ down? Or who could go down to bring Christ up? In other words, who could force revelation to come out of God, but how many are thankful he has revealed himself to us? In many ways, to be sure, general revelation we talk about through creation and conscience, he's revealed that there is a God, and there's only one true living God, and then there's what we call special revelation, that is his word. How many are thankful for his word? Now, can God speak to us through gifts and through callings and Prophecy and these sorts of things, well, and, and, and impressions or whatever words one might want to put on it. Yes, that revelation, however, is always what we would call, uh, like J. Robin Williams, he came up with this, and that's always subordinate revelation. In other words, it must always be subordinate to Scripture. But how many are thankful God reveals Himself to us, to His children? So it's God who speaks. If you want to be used by God, here's the first thing. Don't look to yourself first. Look to God first. And how many are thankful for that? 
So we have the God who speaks. Secondly, when we talk about wanting to be used by God, is we need to have an ear to listen. Now, I don't know about you, but we have a teenage son. And he's a wonderful blessing. But he likes to go around with these earbuds in his ear. Anybody ever notice we have a generation with the earbuds in their ear? You ever notice that? Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, right? And they have the earbuds in their ear. And sometimes you'll be talking. And you think they heard you. But they don't. Anyone ever had that happen before? Yeah. Right? And they don't. And you get through and you've said like 30 seconds worth of stuff. And I say, my oh boy, did you hear me? What, Daddy? <laughs> right? <laughs> you ever had that happen before? Truth be told, some of us who are 29, we don't even need earbuds in our ears to not pay attention. <laughs> right? We can find ways to not pay attention, and we don't even have to have the earbuds or the, the, the headset in our ears. What? You ever been there? Uh, husbands and wives especially, you ever been there? And you're there saying stuff, and, and uh, then you say... Uh, uh, what do you think about that? And you're like, you're like deer in the headlights because you don't know what was just said, right? There's this story about this man that he read in a survey somewhere. I don't know how, anyone ever hear these surveys and these studies and you wonder how they come up with them? But he read a study, a survey by some well-known, this is a true story, I can't remember the exact numbers, but he read it somewhere that there was this study done that said that men speak about 5,000 words a day, the average man. But the average woman speaks about 10,000 words a day. Now, ladies, don't get upset with me because there's a punchline coming. So he found this out. And he thought he'd tease his wife, you know, kind of implies he was talking too much. So he went to her and said, honey, I found this study online. It says that men speak 5,000 words a day and women speak about 10,000 words a day. It says, honey, why is that that you ladies speak twice as much as us? And she said, well, that's easy. He said, well, tell me. And she said, because we have to repeat everything we say to our husbands. <laughs> to which he replied, huh? <laughs> so it is, we can find ways to tune out certain things or not be tuned in where we should. Now, I will tell you, when I say an ear to listen, you may say, and most of the time when people talk about hearing from God and an ear to listen to God, they may think of some things that are mystical in some way and not that there can't be a mystery to it, but I will tell you this. One surefire way that you can hear from God, it works every time that it's tried, is this right here. How many are thankful God has spoken to us in His Word? Now, that doesn't mean, again, God can speak to us in, through uh, various impressions or gifts of the Spirit. He can certainly do that. But I will tell you that if you read your Bible and you're a child of God, if you're a child of God, the Spirit lives on the inside of you. And the Spirit will illuminate the Word to you. You say, how can you say that with such certainty? Because it's God. God wants His children to know His Word. So He gives us His Word and He gives us His Spirit. How many are thankful He's given us, I hate to use the word tools, it seems demeaning, but I don't know what other word to put there. How many are thankful He's given us the tools? And so here it is. He says, here is my Word. And so if you want to have an ear to listen, I will tell you, uh, if, if you're not opening up the pages of the Word of God, then you don't have an ear to listen. Because you're not opening up your ears to hear what God is saying. How many know that's just true? God has spoken to us in His Word. We want to have ears to listen. Some people will say, well, I want to have it. I, I want to know what God, you know, you're talking about being used by God. And I want to know what God wants me to do. And I want to know specifically what God wants me to do. Well, can I tell you one thing for sure? Start reading your Bible. You'll find one thing He wants you to do is He wants you to be His witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria to the uttermost parts of the world. You say, how can you say that with certainty? Because God said it. He said it in His Word. One thing that God would want you to do, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church, and wives love your husbands and as unto the Lord. Fathers, don't provoke your children under wrath. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Don't lie, don't steal, don't, don't uh, commit adultery, don't covet. You say, how can you? I know that's the will of God for you. Why is this written in God's Word? How many want to serve the Lord and have an ear to listen to what He would say? 
Some people say, well, now I want to know exactly. I'm a, I, you're talking about all, but I want to know, well, and I understand that longing, but how many know you want to do for sure what it is you know for sure God has said? How many want to ear to listen to what God has said and to hear what he has said? And he's spoken to us in his word, has he not? And I will tell you, should it be that God would speak through prophecy or through some kind of gift, if you're not steeped in the word, you don't even have a filter through which to take those things and to filter them out and to know what would be of God and what would not. How many of you want to have an ear to listen to God? Okay, so Samuel, the God who speaks and an ear to listen. Next would be this, feet to serve. Feet to serve. Notice every time that Samuel hears his name, he, he thinks that it's Eli calling him at first, right? He doesn't know it's God. In fact, one commentator, and I think it bears, uh, I think he made a good point here. If you notice, God speaks calling Samuel a total of four times here. And the first two times it says that Samuel did not yet know the voice of the Lord or know that it was the Lord. But then after that, he did. And they say it depicts salvation and sanctification. Someone coming to know the Lord and then someone wanting to grow in the Lord. And I think it's a good typology here. But Samuel, when he hears God's voice, call his name Samuel. Samuel. By the way, the very name Samuel means God hears or heard by God. Because he was named Samuel by his mom Hannah because God heard her cry for a child. And she had been barren. God heard her cry and answered her prayer. So she named him Samuel. God hears her. Heard by God. How many thankful that God does hear? And here it is. Is that Samuel's there. And God calls out his name. And Samuel hears it. But he doesn't know it's God. He thinks it's Eli. But what does he do? Samuel gets up out of bed. It's in the middle of the night. He gets up out of bed. And he goes to Eli and says, What can I do for you? How can I serve you? How many know it's good to have feet to serve? I was talking with a brother earlier tonight. And he had no idea what I'd be preaching on. But he was expressing an attitude to want to serve wherever he was at. And how many know that's the child of God? We want to serve. We want to be used by God. And so what happens here is Samuel, each and every time he heard, he wanted to go serve. He didn't just sit there and, uh, you know what, and hit the snooze button three or four times to see if he'd hear the name again. What did he do? When he heard his name call, he had feet that wanted to go and serve. How many want to have feet? That run to want to serve and want to serve God. You say, what labors are there to do? There's many labors to do. What did Jesus say in the New Testament? The fields are white in the harvest, but the laborers are few. It says, therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth what? Laborers. The song whose lyrics I quoted, some people, right, they'll call out and say, God, I need more strength. How many can say you need more strength? I had the first day back in math with seventh graders today. I needed more strength. I had one child that was literally, I, <laughs> he was literally crawling on the floor today. I had to sit in next door. I didn't yell at him. I didn't fuss. I didn't fume. I just sent him to somebody next door for, for a timeout opportunity, didn't I? Yes. I sat him next door. I didn't fuss and fume. He said, Mr. Strong, I didn't. He had all kinds of excuses. I didn't argue with him. I just said, because I just knew. How many know? you got to know your limitations. <laughs> and I knew. I could not deal with that today. So I, I, I had him go next, next door. But we want feet that run to serve. We want to have an attitude to serve. Because the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Heard a message one time when they said, it's one thing to say you have an attitude to serve or an ability to serve, but how many here want a desire to serve and to actually serve and to, to put feet to faith, if you will, to do service in the kingdom of God? I would tell you, if you notice, what did Eli tell? Eli wasn't the one calling. Samuel comes and says, Eli, how can I help you? Because he thought it was Eli. And Eli said, I haven't been calling you. And ultimately, Eli realized it was God who was calling. He says, next time you tell him, here am I, Lord, your servant listens. What did Jesus say? He said, even the Son of Man, speaking of himself, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. What is it that, that uh, the apostles in the New Testament... 
They didn't start out their letters typically by saying, I am great super apostle, great and mighty Oz. Or something. They didn't say that. I am the bond servant of the Lord. And oftentimes the word that's used there in the Greek is doulos, which literally means slave. Many translations will soften it because we don't like that word and for obvious reasons. And I understand that, but the literal word would mean slave, not just servant. How many here know there is nothing better than to be a slave or a servant of God? And here it is. He said, you go and tell him, speak for your servant is listening. Samuel had feet that wanted to go and serve. I'll mention one other scripture. Psalm 1. Right? Uh, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the path of the sinner, or sitteth in the seat of the what? Scornful or scoffer, depending upon your translation. You know, I found throughout my years of life, all 29 of them, I have found that uh, I think those who scoff or scorn the most are those, uh, it said, sit in the seat of the scoffer. <laughs> I think there's something to be said about that. <laughs> How many know the more you're on your feet, probably the less you're scoffing, <laughs> right? As far as serving and what have you. And so Samuel had feet to serve. He didn't just say, I'm willing to serve. He didn't say just for a certain thing. But he ran to Eli to serve. And then when it came to Eli, said, it's not me that's calling you. It's God. He said, I am the servant of the Lord. Here am I, Lord. So to be used by God, depend upon a God who speaks. Have an ear to listen. Have feet to serve. Next, have a humble heart. So here it is, is that Samuel goes, and what does Samuel do? Samuel, he goes, he says, your servant is here, Lord. He realizes it's God now. Your servant is here, Lord. And what does God tell him? God tells him that destruction is about to come upon Eli's house. Now again, if you read 1 Samuel chapter 1 and 1 Samuel chapter 2, Eli was the priest. 1 Samuel is like a transition time. The people of God are getting ready to go from being ruled by judges to in 1 Samuel they'll be ruled by a king. They rejected theocracy and instead wanted to be like the nations around them. How many know when you want to be like the nations around you, that's a problem. In other words, when you want to be like people around you, rather than look and see what God wants, that's a problem. And that's what the people did. They said, give us a king, ultimately they will say to Samuel later on in this first book of 1 Samuel. Give us a king. Why? Because they wanted to be like the nations around them rather than being ruled by God. And so this is a transitional time where they will reject God as king. And then what will happen? God will ultimately reject their first king, won't he? He'll reject Saul. And he'll raise up David, a man after his own heart. And he'll ultimately, in 2 Samuel, through the prophet Nathan, make a promise to David that one of his descendants would be upon the throne forever. Who is he talking about? Who is the descendant of David that will be on the throne forever? Jesus, of course. And so in this transitional period where they reject God and then God rejects the, the, the king goes, and, and then he says, I'm going to, it's prophesying Jesus, the king who is to come, pointing to Jesus. Not only is there a king spoken of here who will come, but there's also a priest who will come. If you read Eli, Eli, when we read about Eli, he served God seemingly fairly faithfully, it would seem. But his sons, Hophni and Phinehas, he had two sons that that were serving there too, and they were not good. They did not know the Lord. Scripture says that specifically. Eli's two sons that were involved in the priesthood, you know what they did? Two things that have been epidemic in especially quote-unquote ministers, or those who espouse to be ministers, and to some degree Christians at large over the course of time, or at least professing Christians anyway, is what they did, here's what they fell into. They committed uh, adulterous acts with the women who were there at the temple. How many know that's happened over the course of time to so many? You know, right? And what did they do? But they took offerings, too, that weren't theirs to take. They took sacrifices that weren't theirs to take. Two things that will get to a minister, especially, but to any child of God, uh, golden gals, I heard. And that's what they did. And they did not, they were involved in these adulterous, they're supposed to be the, the two of the high priests there, two of the higher priestly order, so to speak, because they're the sons of Eli, the main man, and here they are, taking offerings they're not supposed to take, 
and having relations with women they're not supposed to have. How many know that set a bad witness to those who came there to the temple? And if you read at the end of 1 Samuel chapter 2, a prophet comes to Eli. And that prophet says, Eli, you have not corrected your sons. And because of that, they're going to die on the same day. And you're going to die too. And I have rejected your family from being priests. And I'm going to raise up somebody, said this prophet, who's going to be an enduring priest. Who's going to be a good priest. And those who read that may think, oh, that's talking about Samuel who was to come. Well, indeed it is to a degree because Samuel would be better than Eli, although his kids would have issues too. But that he would be the next coming priest. But how many know the enduring priest, the good priest, the great high priest is only one. The same as the better king is the better priest. And who's it pointing to? Jesus. And so Eli, he already had this prophet come and tell him these things. And so what happened is Samuel, he hears these things from God himself. What's going to happen to Eli's house? Now Samuel, he didn't go like uh, many of us, right? If we heard something like that and we knew we were going to be the next one in line to take over, I'd go say, hey, 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 Eli, I got news to tell you. You won't get it. And your sons are going to get it. I'm going to take over. How many know that's the fleshly way to think of things? If David had thought that way, when he later on gets prophecy from Samuel, in 1 Samuel 16, that he was going to be king, he'd go in 1 Samuel 17, and after Goliath was defeated, he goes, that's all. <laughs> Your date's number, buddy. I'm coming out here. I'm the next man. I'm on the... But how many know that's not how Samuel reacted, nor the way David reacted? Why? Because they had humble hearts. How many here want to have a humble heart? If you want to serve God, and every child of God should, one thing that would be something that would be on the, the list of character traits that you want to have is a humble heart. How many are thankful those who come unto him, he'll no wise cast aside. King David would say in Psalm 51 that a humble and contrite spirit he'll not despise. How many want to have a humble heart? To where if God does use you and to where if God does use us and to where as we're in service of God that we would not be like the, uh, I heard someone say one time is that most people are kind of like, remember Jesus when uh, we sang about it a little bit tonight on the opening song. Jesus was going up on his way to Jerusalem. He lifted high on a tree that he might draw a man over here. Well, the multitude began to praise him while others were trying to stop him. He said, if they hold their peace. The rocks are going to crack. Uh, that's referring to the triumphal entry, right? And this preacher said one time, says, most Christians or professing Christians are kind of like the donkey that Jesus rode on. The folks start clapping and cheering, and they think it's about them. <laughs> now we know it ain't. It's about Jesus, right? Not to us, not to us, but to him be all the glory. So a humble heart. Samuel had a humble heart. He did not come and rejoice that, hey, Eli, you're going to get it, and I'm next on the scene. In fact, what did Samuel do? The very next day, he goes about serving Eli and serving the Lord the same as, as he had been doing. You notice King David, after he was anointed to be king in 1 Samuel 16, you go to 1 Samuel 17, he's not even on the battlefield at the start of things. But he keeps on serving and shepherding and doing the things that God would have him to do. How many here know a humble heart God will not despise? And so here it is, a humble heart. Samuel had a humble heart. Next is this, and here's the last one. It's truthful lips. How many here want to have lips that speak the truth? Lips that speak the truth. I tell you, we live in a world filled with lies, don't we? It's becoming more and more difficult, I think. And, and this is one reason, one of many reasons, why it's so important for God's people to be engaged with the word of God and to know the word of God. Why? Jesus said in John 17, 17, he's praying the high priestly prayer to his father. He says, Father, sanctify them according to thy truth. And then he says, thy word is truth. We need to be grounded to the word of God so that we're grounded to the truth because this world is filled with ever increasing lies. Is it not? Jesus said in John chapter 8, when the devil speaks he speaks lies. And when he speaks lies, he's speaking his native language. Because he was a liar from the beginning and the father of lies and a murderer and the truth is not in him. How do we know we need to be people of the truth? 
so that we be not deceived. And what is it that Samuel said? He had truthful lips. Eli comes and Eli says, you tell me now what God said. Don't hold anything back. Because if you do, whatever was said, let it come on you. And Samuel, he doesn't take any delight in it. He doesn't. Uh, can you imagine? Here's a young boy, 12 years old, perhaps that young, but at, at any rate, only a late teen at best. And here's an old man that has been served the Lord for a long time. And Samuel's heard this word that God said, I'm going to judge that man's house. And that man says, tell me what God said. If you read back to that verse, it was at night that God called Samuel. And it says that after that last time, after God spoke to him about what he's going to do to Eli's house, it says Samuel lay back down. It doesn't say necessarily that he slept. I don't know if he did or not, but I will say, how many know if you heard such a thing that God was getting ready to do such a thing, you make your ears tingle and not tingle in the way of, of, of good, but tingle in the way of bad, which is, is what it says in the way that, of judgment anyway. That, that it might be hard to sleep later on that night, right? But in the morning time, Eli says, you tell me what God said and don't hold back. Don't you, don't you say it uh, some way other than, and Samuel tells him everything. He speaks the truth. Now in the Bible, we just know that he told him everything. We don't always have tone in scripture, but I tend to think from Samuel's humble heart, his servant's heart, his heart that no doubt loved Eli, I think there were probably a lot of tears involved in that conversation. I think it was probably a, a weeping prophet moment. I don't know that. That's just a thus thinketh me, so you can take it for with a grain of salt. But he tells Eli the truth. He doesn't sugarcoat it. He tells him exactly what God had said. And can I tell you? I, I was reading here. We had a message a couple Sundays ago. Seven things that God hates from Proverbs 6, 7, 16, 17, and 19. And it was listed, seven things that God hates. And messages like that can seem to be somewhat tough and somewhat difficult. But right before that message, I'd been preparing that message and almost had all my notes completed. And I read on there where it said, and I, I'll get it wrong, but some pastor that I'll look at what he posts every now and again. And he said, said, Pastor, tomorrow is the day they'll preach the word of God. Says something to the effect of, we're not to... to, to coddle God's children, but we're to, uh, we're to tell them the truth, even if it seems tough. And how many know that is true? Yep. We speak the truth in love, but don't speak a lie. Speak the truth, even if it's tough. Proverbs says that faithful are the cuts of a friend, but the, the caresses of the evil one or the kisses of the evil one, they're deceptive. How many know sometimes the truth can be seemingly difficult and it can make our ears not be tickled. Tickled means we tell everybody what they want to hear. But tingled, tingled as it uses it here, means ooh, it might have a sharp edge to it. But how many know sometimes we need the sharp edges? Amen. Thank you, Brother Rick. I was waiting for an amen there. Sometimes we need the sharp edges. Amen. Amen. Don't we? Right? Sometimes we need the sharp edges. Why? Because we need to hear the truth. We need to hear the truth. I hope it would be that we would rather hear the truth, even if it seems difficult, than hear a lie, and even if it makes us feel better. There's a lot of lies that can make us feel better, but how many know the, the truth is what we need, isn't it? And here it is. Samuel, he speaks the truth to Eli about the judgment of God that was going to come upon him. Because he did not correct the misdeeds of his sons. If you read in the next chapter, 1 Samuel chapter 4, indeed judgment does come just the way the prophet, the unnamed prophet in 1 Samuel 2 told Eli, and just the way Samuel spoke it here to Eli in 1 Samuel chapter 3. What happens? It happens just the way God says. The people of God, the Philistines, are coming to fight against the Philistines. They're getting creamed. And so what do the people of God do? Oh, we're going to bring out our secret weapon. That's really kind of the tenor of that chapter. We're going to bring out the Ark of the Covenant of God. And we're going to shout before the Ark of the Covenant of God. And it says they shouted in such a way that made the earth tremble. But how do we know their heart was in it? And what ends up happening? But the people of God get defeated. The Ark gets taken. Hophni and Phinehas 
the two sons of Eli, they die in the same day, as does Eli and the, the, uh, the, the wife that was bearing the child of one of Eli's sons, she dies too, and when she bears a child, she calls him Ichabod, for the glory had departed. How I many that's that's severe judgment. Terrible things, I say terrible things, judgment things happen because those two sons did not repent. Samuel had truthful lips. How many here want truthful lips? Samuel spoke the truth. So to be used by God, depend upon the God who speaks, the God who calls, the God who will empower, who in the words that I've been quoting from this song, who gives more grace when the burdens go greater, who adds more strength when the labors increase. How many are thankful for that? Trust in Him. Then have an ear to listen. And by having an ear to listen, do I mean prayer? Yes, of course I mean prayer. But I will tell you, I also mean having an ear to listen to God's Word means actually being in the Word of God, the Scripture that He has given us. If we're not in His Word, how can we say we have an ear to listen? we got earbuds in our ear. <laughs> right? Have, have feet that are quick to serve. Have feet that are quick to serve. Have a heart that is humble. Have lips that are truthful. Now, of course... I would be remiss, and we've already done this in a couple capacities. Who was the greater king that we pointed to? Jesus. Who was the greater priest that would be pointed to? Jesus. Who's the one used this the, the title of this message? How to be used by God in certain traits or things for us to look at and consider. Who's the one that's used by God the most, of course, is God in the flesh himself? Jesus. What did he say with regard to the God? Who, who calls, right? The God who speaks and having a listening ear, Jesus said in his humanity, because fully God and fully man, so they only speak the words that I hear the Father speaking. Feet quick to serve. Jesus, he walked around everywhere doing good, healing all who were oppressed to the devil, for God was with him, and he came not just to, to uh, he didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. A humble heart, what did Jesus say? He said in Matthew's Gospel, He said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and humble or lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Who's the ultimate one with the humble heart? Jesus. And then who's the ultimate one who has truthful lips? Jesus. Samuel, notice, it says here, uh, verse 19, Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and the Lord let none of his words fail. Samuel being a true prophet who spoke the truth. And can I tell you, here it is, Jesus was the one who not only spoke the truth, but who is the truth, the life, the way. No one comes to the Father except by him. I'll give you one last thing before we leave tonight. Those of you familiar with 1 Samuel, those Samuel gets to be an old man. He serves God. Samuel was prophet, priest, and judge. Think about that. There's only one greater with titles, and that's Jesus, prophet, priest, and king. And then Samuel, he gets older, and he lives a lot of life. And he sees Saul raised up, and God rejects him. And he sees David raised up, and he's used by God in so many ways. Then Samuel dies. And toward the end of the book of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel 28, if memory serves, 1 Samuel 28, Saul is desperate. He knows he's rejected. He knows he's on his way out. And he goes to some witch of Endor. And he says, conjure up for me Samuel. Now, why this worked exactly, I don't pretend to know. But I will tell you that somehow, some way, what happens? Samuel is called back from the dead. And what does Samuel say? Samuel tells Saul, you're going to get it, buddy. That's the Ben's paraphrased version. So you're going to get, in fact, you're going to get it tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow, you're done. You're going to get judged. But he spoke the truth even from the dead. And what did he speak from the dead? But he spoke judgment. 
How many are thankful there is the greater king and the greater peace who arose from the dead? And yes, indeed, should those not repent, he will come in judgment. But aren't you thankful that the greater king, the greater peace arose from the dead and said, those who believe in him shall have eternal and everlasting life. That's good news. Amen. Amen. So we look to Jesus, the altar and finisher of our faith. Let's stand to our feet tonight. Father, we come before you tonight. We thank you, dear God. Our hearts as children of God, we long to be used by you. Lord, in ways that the world might consider small or in ways that the world might consider large or that even in our uh, fleshly minds we might consider large or small. But may we have no eye toward that. May we simply have humble heart that says, God, as Samuel did, here am I. Use me. Whatever capacity. And Lord, we are thankful that to be used by you, we do not depend upon our own strength or our own resource. Or even upon our initiative. But upon you, God. The God who speaks and reveals himself in your word. Through the power of your spirit. If we're saved, the God who has called us. Lord, we lean upon you and not upon our own strength. And God, we pray that we, your people, to be used by you, we pray that we would have ears to hear. Yes, in prayer. Yes, through gifts. But through being in, 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 into your word, dear God. You have spoken to us through your word. May we indeed be in the pages of your word to have an ear to hear what you would say. May we have feet that are quick to want to serve genuine service. Not for our own glory, but for the glory of God is so foreign to this world. But we pray that it would be the desire of your children. Lord, that we would have feet to serve. And that we would have indeed a humble heart. A humble heart. Who is not proud, which you resist, but is humble and receives your grace. And gives you the glory for the grace that you bestow. We pray, dear God, that we indeed would have truthful lips. Lips that speak your word. Lips that are informed by a knowledge of your word. From study and empowered by your spirit. Lips that speak the truth of God instead of the lies of the evil one. And Lord, as we learn from this passage here tonight and from all passages of scripture... May we forever be pointed to, drawn to, and glorify Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Lord, use my brothers and sisters in various ways and capacities. I know it would be their heart's desire. And use us individually and collectively in the work of your kingdom. For indeed, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Lord, we pray tonight if there be any here that know not Christ... They don't know the Lord. Then I pray tonight by the preaching of your word, by the power of your spirit, that the God who speaks would speak to them and convict them of sin, righteousness, and of judgment, and of the truth that apart from Christ they are in severe trouble and stand in danger of the judgment that is to come. And I pray they would know that the greater priest who died for them and intercedes that the greater king who rules and reigns forever and yet yielded up his life upon the cross to pay for the sin of all the world. Those who would believe in him can have their sins forgiven. And I pray tonight if there be any that know not Christ, they come in something like this. Lord Jesus, forgive me my sin. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. You, Jesus, are the only Savior. Make me your child. Lord, be with my brothers and sisters. Strengthen them in their most holy faith. Encourage them in their walk with the Lord. Fill them with the power of your spirit. Draw them to the truth of your word. Enlighten our eyes and give us minds to, to perceive and lips to speak the truth and a humble heart and feet to serve, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray and the power of the spirit would come. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. May he lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. May you know it is the hope you're calling of God in Christ Jesus and the surpassing greatness of his power extend to all who believe. Amen and...
Amen. God bless you tonight.